Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Saving Ocean Wildlife webinar series. We really appreciate that you are all here tonight. And my name is Laura Casa. I'm the director at Saving Ocean Wildlife. And I first want to thank our supporters and our donors that have made it possible to provide this free webinar series to the public. So thank you, all of you that have been supporting our programs uh, during our time. And we've got a really exciting presentation tonight, such an interesting topic with one of the experts in the field for whale rescue. Ed Lyman is here from Hawaii and he's gonna be showing some great footage and telling you about a job that you probably would have no idea what it takes. Very technical, very difficult, but very inspiring the work that he and his team do. But first, I just wanted to give a little bit, bit of background on Saving Ocean Wildlife because maybe for some of you, this might be the first time that you're attending one of our events. So we are a nonprofit project of the Ocean Foundation. The Ocean Foundation has been around for 20 years supporting ocean conservation projects. So we're really grateful to be a partner with them. Next slide, please. And our vision is a healthy ecosystem where all wildlife thrive as a result of an informed society. So holding webinars like this is just one way that we raise awareness towards our vision. And our mission is creating ocean partnerships to protect wildlife because certainly we couldn't do this alone. It's all about the partnerships that we can create to address some of the threats going on to our wildlife. Next slide, please. And the way we accomplish our mission is in three ways. First of all, we do outreach. So tonight is one example of that outreach, but we also do in-person outreach through our dock walking program. And that's a program that we work with the state of California, Division of Boating and Waterways, to hand out free clean boater kits. And we also hand out lanyards that have the wildlife hotline number on them. So we can tell boaters how they can report an animal in distress if they see one. And then we also have this free wildlife guide on our website, which showcases some of these amazing animals that you'll see in the Pacific Ocean. It also talks about threats to them and gives you ways to identify them. So if you're out there on the beach or on your boat, you might see them, you'll be able to identify which animal species you're actually looking at. So that's our first step, just raising the awareness of what's going on right in your backyard. But we take it a step further with reporting. What we really want is the public to know what to do in case of an emergency. If they see a stranded dolphin or a sea lion with a, a six pack ring around its neck, people really wanna help. But oftentimes we've found out people don't know what phone number to call. So our goal is to get this information into the public's hands. We like to consider ourselves the bridge between the rescue agencies that can rescue these animals and the community that's likely to see these animals and report them in the first place. So we have a, a phone number set up here in California. It's 1-877-SOS-WHALE, and that's if you see an entangled whale, you can call that hotline. But we're excited to announce tonight that the new Whale Alert 3.0 version is out as a way to use an app to actually report this information. So that's an exciting way to put the power right in your hands to make a difference. The third thing we do is go a step beyond that reporting to actually providing rescue support. So it's great that someone might report a whale, say they're, say they're out on the boat uh, just for an afternoon and they see an entangled whale and they call it in and they report it to NOAA who's in charge of the response effort. But then if that boat can't stand by that whale, it could take several hours for the rescue team to arrive. And by the time they get to the last spot the whale was seen, it could be long gone by then. And therefore we're trying to find a needle in a haystack and the chances of that whale getting rescued or at least an attempt at a rescue is very slim. So Saving Ocean Wildlife was created because we saw this gap. We saw the gap between that three to five hour window where that whale, even if it's carrying thousands of pounds of gear, will still be way beyond the area where it was first seen. So we're organizing volunteer boaters that wanna be part of this first responder fleet to help in this effort. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we can't do it without our partners. So we work with local communities like yours to educate people about how to report on animals. We do our dock walking program in, boater, in, in marinas or any place a boater might be, perhaps the yacht club. And we're working with the government agencies like NOAA as we'll see tonight, who are actually doing the rescue themselves. But we can also work with businesses. We'd love businesses to get involved to help spread the message of here's the way you report an animal in distress. So we really would love to work with all aspects of our community to help address this problem. And I'm really excited tonight to announce a new partner 
the International Fund for Animal Welfare, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, it's, it's an organization that is global, has been working on animal welfare issues and campaigns for 50 years. And they're so well respected and we're grateful to be their partner in our effort to do the outreach for reporting on entangled will specifically here in California. And we're so fortunate to have Patrick Ramaj from IFA here with us tonight. Patrick, would you like to just say a few words? Hi, Laura, and hi, everyone. Um, greetings from about as far back east in this country as one can get. I'm Pat Gramaj, and I'm with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, based on Cape Cod, near our International Operations um, Center, um, where um, we confront some of the same issues along the Atlantic coast that Saving Ocean Wildlife and partners like NOAA um, uh, and Ed certainly are addressing in the Pacific. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege um, for IFA to join formally as a partner with Saving Ocean Wildlife. Um, these issues are critical and as Laura has noted, the gap um, of um, citizen action and individual um, action and reporting of ocean wildlife um, in distress and need of assistance is such a critical piece of ensuring um, their welfare, boating safety, and a whole range of issues that Saving Ocean Wildlife has covered. It's a privilege for me and some of our partners, um, certainly the Ocean Foundation and um, Conserve.io, with whom we have partnered on the Whale Alert app that you mentioned, um, Laura, are all together this evening. And I'm really looking forward to Ed's presentation. And thanks so much to you and Saving Ocean Wildlife for convening us this evening. Thank you, Patrick. And I'm sure everybody else is thinking the same thing. I want to see the whale rescue work. Let's let's get Ed on the screen. So I want to turn it over to Ed in just a moment. I just want to let everybody know we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So this is an hour long webinar. We'll, we'll do the presentation and then we'll have 15 minutes to do a Q&A. So please send any questions you might have throughout the presentation to Cyana. She's our awesome communications. Uh, coordinator, and she will field the questions and try to group them together, and then I'll ask the questions during that Q&A. So next slide, please. We're so lucky, as I said, to have Ed Lyman all the way from Hawaii joining us tonight. Ed has a pretty incredible job. He works as a natural resource specialist and regional large whale entanglement response coordinator for the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. Wow, that is quite a mouthful. Ed has been one of the pioneers in this field. It takes just a certain person to be able to get out there on a small boat and cut the lines off of a whale. And he is one of them that it's done it and he's trained people as well. And he's tonight gonna focus on not just the rescues but the fact that this is really a team effort and the importance of that on the water community to make all of this happen. So Ed, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really excited to see your presentation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. That was an excellent introduction there and aloha everyone. Uh, it's my honor to speak tonight with everyone. Uh, as Laura mentioned, a big team effort. And I wanna take a different tack. I, I do a lot of um, different effort with the entanglement response with large whales. And I do a lot of these lectures, but I, I definitely wanna pay homage or give acknowledgement to a portion that we've all been speaking to, the foundation of the effort, that community effort, that team effort. And so what I want to do first is show you a video clip. We're going to jump right into some imagery here. Let's see if this plays out. Okay. And I tone the music down. This video is playing. Uh, it's a lot of action. We've cherry picked some of the action, some of the disentanglement efforts. Okay. Notice the title slide says entanglement response. Okay. So it can be, this is what people tend to focus on, by the way, is cutting the whale free. That's the primary goal right now. Maybe not. The goals and the impacts are much broader. And the people involved, that's the message. People tend to focus on the people in that inflatable boat cutting the whale free. And yet the effort is so much broader than what you're seeing in this video clip. Okay, so I have to emphasize that quite a bit here. And that's what I want to uh, go over here and start with is dissecting the overall entanglement response effort here. So here's my first slide. Static shows an entangled humpback whale with a uh, Actually, it's not, even, it's not even fishing gear, it's cable, coaxial cable in the whale's mouth. But our goals here, if you haven't already figured out how broad they are, is we do wanna free some whales from life-threatening entanglements. So I threw that up there at the top. We obviously want to keep everyone safe, keep the responders safe, keep people safe, the general public, 
People care about these animals. People want to help. They're well-intentioned, except in this case, it can be very dangerous. As you're going to see from some of these clips, it is not an easy task. Okay? We want the people that are trained, well-equipped, to have the experience to take on these, on these particular roles. And yet there are other roles to play. The other objective here in that broad scope of objectives, the reason why we don't call it disentanglement response, we call it entanglement response, is to gain information. It is the science behind this effort. So we can stop cutting whales free one by one and figure out what is going on. What, where did the gear come from? What type of gear? What part of the gear? Information towards prevention. And here's the thing. Here's, uh, I'm trying to graphically show this because the on-water community is a key, critical role here. Okay, they may not be the ones in the inflatable, may not be the ones wielding the knives, but they are the foundation of the effort because they have connections with all those goals. And I'll just show you those. Everything from the reporting that both Patrick and, and Laura mentioned, critical. We don't cut a whale free unless we hear about it. We get information, initial risk assessment, so we know what to do. Um, it helps with the public safety side of things, so if people know the appropriate roles to play. Again, there are many roles to play. But um, back to the reporting is a critical one. And then helping us gain the information. That report provides initial first responder information, risk assessment. And that is critical here. We want to get ahead of the curve, we can. So then those are interrelated. I threw some extra arrows there. Obviously, you get cutting a well free in itself is going to gain us information. So those are related in that regard. And again, I just want to emphasize just the key role that the, especially the on-water community plays here. See, every, it just increases our understanding and, and both on gaining that information, but also on, the, also on the authorized response. It's all based on reporting. It's, again, it's, I can't emphasize this enough. It's foundational, okay? Um, it's where it all starts. And we rely very heavily on the, really what ends up being opportunistic reports from that on-water community, okay? Uh, it's critical. Um, so, and I want to point out that whether you're up in Alaska, and I'm going to stay a little closer to home. I'm not going to go back. I did used to work uh, on the East Coast uh, where Patrick said he was from, Cape Cod. But I'm going to stick a little closer to home here. I'm going to stay in the North Pacific. And I just want to point out those first responders, those community roles, whether you're up in Alaska in that remote environment. This, this was reported by the on water community up in Dutch Harbor, of all places, out in the Aleutian chain and responders were able to cut that humpback whale free. And then we take in the West Coast. Here's uh, Peter Falkins with his team cutting a whale free. It's a gray whale, okay? And there's different challenges in the different regions, but the common commonality here is always, we need the community to help us as appropriate. And they're able to cut this gray whale free. And then take you to Hawaii, okay? Again, it's not all paradise here. It's, we have some calm water, it's warm water, but we have our challenges. We have uh, whales that are kind of, pumped up on hormones, it's a breeding calving time. We got mothers that are protective of little calves and that's exactly what you're seeing there on the image. So we need the help as appropriate of that on water community to find these animals, give us that initial risk assessment, maybe stand by. So we'll go into a little bit more detail in a second. Okay. But since I've just made you a member of the team, okay? Everyone is a member of this team, okay? We're one big grassroots um, effort here. I want to give you some background. So just real quick, it's a global threat, okay, entanglement threat. It's not just in the North Pacific here. It involves a variety of gear. It's not always fishing gear. That's one of those mis um, misnomers there of sorts. And then there's many species impa uh, impacted, okay, all, pretty much all of them. And again, we want to focus on the large whales. And I'm going to point out that even a large whale is going to be impacted by entanglement. Okay, their size is not going to make them immune from it. So if this video clip is playing, it shows an adult humpback whale in Hawaii. And I will use Hawaii as many of our examples. Remember, this is global or national, however you want to look at it. Okay. So here are some of those impacts. I'm going to just go a little bit deeper here. And the reason why is not only the background, but also the fact that I've made you part of the team. It's the risk assessment. These are the things you want to be looking for. If you happen to be on the water, you happen to come across an entangled whale. Some of these are easy. Physical trauma, lines cutting through parts of the body, like you see in the upper image. Then there's general deterioration of health. It might be things like rough skin um, that is sloughing off. It might be light-colored skin. That's the upper right-hand image. That is not an albino whale. 
And then on the lower right-hand image, you see patches of coloration. Those are whale lice or cyamid amphipods. Typically compromised animals will show that. So these are the visual health indicators that everyone can help us with. Gives us a cue or a clue that something's going on. And then you have associated threats, whales getting entangled in gear, then are have an inability to maneuver and get hit by a boat. So there's interrelationships there. Even climate change comes into play. Then starvation, you see a, a thin whale there. there. That inability to maneuver stops them from feeding or prevents, hinders feeding. And then if the entanglement is severe enough, they can drown. Okay, so those are the impacts, some of them, as well as the assessment. Now, those were individual impacts that can also be uh, broad-based population level impacts. So there's a, an estimate there, it's somewhat dated, but a great scientific estimate of Andrew Reed and, and others of 308,000 whales, all whales, per year, globally falling victim to entanglement threat. So it, that is one indication of just how big this threat is. It is an underestimate. I can gu guarantee you that, okay? So it's scratching the surface. It is co indeed considered one of the largest human caused anthropogenic threats out there for the large whales. And for some species, it, it can be big. It can be a major impact to the population. For instance, the North Atlantic right whale would be a good example of that, of the Keita. Okay. Now, I did say I was going to give you some examples and focus on Hawaii here. So if this uh, image has come up, it shows basically our, well, one, the number of reports we've received over the years, you know, over the last 20 years, 432 reports. Now, those end up being about half of those end up being confirmed entanglements. So that's one thing when you're asking the public to help you, maybe they didn't get a good look at the whale. Maybe they made a mistake. Half of those are, are confirmed reports. And filtering that down, about 151 of those are actually, well, it's the actual number of animals involved in those reports, okay? So again, you might say, well, not, not that many, but they are needles in a haystack. And we basically need your help to find those needles in those haystack or in that haystack. Uh, those uh, bar diagram or the bar diagram shows the number of cases or reported animals per season for us in Hawaii. And by the way, this would be the same for the West Coast, pretty similar uh, for Alaska region as well, similar kind of numbers. Um, a little bit more variable. And then behind you, you see where the whales were reported entangled for the most part, not where they got entangled. Again, big animals can rip the gear off the ocean floor, swim off with it. Now we have to go find them. We've got to find that mobile needle out there. So a lot of times it's where the whales are, where they go, and where the effort lies, where the on-water community or the near shore community is out there to help us find. Now, I'm gonna give you one more example of just why or how we know this is a fairly large threat to the large whales, to whales in general. I'm gonna show you how scar analysis is kind of a, these will be the um, non-lethal indication of the impact of, of an entanglement because it tells you what animal was entangled and they were able to get out of the entanglement. That's what scar analysis is about. Hey, researchers are out there doing, taking pictures of whales. So why not add this dimension? They are indeed doing that. And uh, the numbers there for Hawaii are pretty low, actually. Um, it's actually averages out almost one in every five humpback whales for us in Hawaii, the breeding cabin ground, end up being recently entangled from, from the star analysis, looking at that. Okay, those numbers, by the way, let's show you some others. One, it's pervasive. Wherever you look, you find entangled whales. You see some imagery there. You see values running from generally 30% up to 70%. For some species, it's up close to 90%, like those North Atlantic right whales, okay? And we know we're not finding them all, okay? So we know, again, the needle in the haystack. And here's another side of this. When it comes to response, we need your help because operationally, the assessment you provide tells us whether we should intervene or not. From the, the logic here is if they're getting, if we're seeing scarred whales, they're getting out of the gear on their own. We need to know um, when you see an entangled whale, whether that might be an animal that will throw the gear on its own or whether we should intervene or not. And then I mentioned just how broad based these impacts are. And, and you know, I mentioned the individual impacts, the animals, I mentioned the population level impacts, but they go broader than that. Um, I gave you some examples here. And one of them is the sort of the biological impact the, to the ecosystem. I'll put it that way, where you lo you're losing animals and you're losing that part of the niche, the ecosystem that shifts everything. So it has big repercussions potentially. There's socioeconomic 
examples here of like fishing industry, they don't want to catch a whale. They're losing gear, losing fishing time. Maybe someone gets hurt from the entangled whale in their gear. And then tourism, just some examples there. Cultural impacts from indigenous communities that uh, have um, that put a lot of priority on that species. And then response impacts, people getting hurt from trying to save the whale aspect. So these are just some quick examples here. These impacts, I just want to point out, because these animals are large, generally speaking, uh, again, I'm showing you humpback whales. We're coming up to our breeding calving season for humpback whales in Hawaii waters. And uh, this is a yearling. It's returned from its mother. It's entangled in gear, but it's dragged that gear over weeks and weeks and weeks of time and over thousands of miles. The impact is not typically immediate. That buys them some time. And as a result, it buys us some time, okay, to do this, to actually attempt Okay, to free a whale from a life-threatening entanglement. And just some, I'm gonna start getting in some of the video uh, imagery here and show you indeed just how we do this, okay? The big animals help us. They also hinder us, by the way, okay? And here's an example of that. This is not an easy task, okay? They are indeed, you know, 40 tons for a humpback whale, an adult, 45 feet long, generally speaking. And you can see here's a case where we had to stand down. Uh, that whale was, they're individuals. They don't, always don't understand that you're there to try to save them. So um, you have to be careful. And that is why, by the way, I'm gonna introduce another team member here. This is NOAA Fisheries and their Office of Protected Resources. They have stepped up to provide oversight for this response effort. Remember, there are risks to the animals from the response. There's risk to the people side as well. And they've stepped up, lent a hand, have the oversight. It's a permitted activity. They provide authorization. Basically what they're looking for is the right people for the right roles, um, people that are trained, equipped, um, to have the experience and oversee that. So it's permanent activity. And our goals, coming back to that, you're going, hey, why even do this? It's risky. Okay, and I found this on the web for when you're looking for the right people for the right roles, people that are trained, equipped. That okay, Siri came in there and wanted to jump in on my talk. So um, kind of comical, but this comes back to goals. Okay, why we take on these risks? Because overall, we are trying to reduce those risks. Okay, we want to release some whales from life threatening entanglements. Critical part of this, but it's a band aid. We're not ever going to do this. We're never going to accomplish saving every whale. We can increase awareness because that's going to promote stewardship, increase the reporting, help us with risk assessments, things of that nature. And the big one is gaining information. And again, the reporting helps us there. Okay, it's the science behind the effort. Okay, now there's obstacles here. Okay, whether it's on the cutting the whale free side, there are big animals, big ocean, intense motivations. There is limited resources. We don't have, like, we're not paying everyone to sit there and wait uh, with every piece of gear they might have to wait for that whale to show up and be cut free. It doesn't work that way. It's pretty much a volunteer network for the most part. Okay, and here's the big one relatively rare reports that we get that we can respond to. So back to the numbers game there. Let's look at the science side, same thing. We rely on optimistic reporting, okay, that need to be verified. Uh, we have reports in removed in, in time and space. I showed you that example of Hawaii. They drag the gear from one place to the other before they're found. We have difficulties in identifying the gear and we are looking at a moving target, okay? There is, it's very dynamic. Gears change, fishing efforts change, whale distribution changes maybe from climate change. And indeed we're seeing hints of that. So all kinds of change, moving target. And back to relatively rare reports. Our sample size is small. And that graphic I'm trying to show you is just that how it changes in size, getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we get more detail in our data, okay? So, okay. And then uh, here, I just, I'm emphasizing, you know, where is Waldo? Is back to how important the reporting is and finding the animals is, again, they are indeed needles in a haystack. And people, I, I emphasize this because people just don't believe that a, an entangled whale dragging a, a, a large poly ball behind it is going to be that needle. And indeed, they are. They get big haystack. And they're mobile. Um, so that doesn't help us either. And again, we're relying on opportunistic reporting. We're not paying people for directed, dedicated surveys. In all cases, there is some of that, 
but we need to build upon that dedicated directed effort. And that's again where the community role comes into. You know, I'm, I'm generalized here, kind of pulling the Pacific data together, and I'm estimating over 80% of our responses started from the community reports, not dedicated directed efforts. Okay. That by itself should be a, a, a strong data point to take a take home message there. And again, the roles are finding, reporting, assessing, uh, documenting. It's a hard copy of assessment. Uh, monitoring, and what I mean by that is you might report and that that authorized team is on, well, they're on, on their way, okay? But it might take them two hours to get there. We might ask people safe and legally to stand by, to monitor the animal, not lose it until the team arrives on scene. And of course, pass on the information you acquired in the meantime. And, and that's back to the third point again, gaining information, okay? So we can reduce this threat overall, okay? And here I'm doing in this next image is I'm pointing out once again that that risk assessment that you are providing, okay, if you come across an entangled whale, is both for the animal's sake, so I call that a valuative risk assessment. You're telling us how bad the entanglement is. Uh, the information does tell us it's confirmed. It is a life threatening entanglement. It tells us maybe even what knife we need to use and who we might want to bring in there, okay? okay? And I just did do a little. Um, segue there because the other part of it is the operational risk assessment. And that's really the example of who do we need, what tools we might need, uh, what resources do we bring to bear? That's the operational side, okay? Brings an incident command system and all. And then just to delve a little deeper here, some examples of what we will be asking that first responder, because that's what you end up being, is basic information, obviously date and time of the sighting, uh, what what species, what the ID might be. What If you've got a, an ID, a flank shot of a gray whale, underside of a fluke, a tail of a humpback whale, that helps. The impact of the animal, how many wraps, how tight are they, things of that nature. Condition of the animal, description of the gear, um, even to the extent of maybe the ID of the gear so we can figure out what where it came from and all, but also what it might be to help us in dealing with it and cutting it free. Okay? So lots of information we'll be asking. This is just some examples here. And then there are the misreports too. I Real quickly, I'm not gonna emphasize this, but again, because this might be someone from the, from the shore looking out. It might be someone that didn't get close because they're not allowed to get close or they don't want to get close. So they didn't get a good look, but sometimes things like playing with the gear, just a whale being close to the gear, those line scars have been misreported as entanglements. A whale that's breaching 40 times in a row. Some people think that's an entangled whale. Maybe not, okay? There's things like the body coloration. Uh, the whale is just turned upside down, showing you its belly, showing the white. And here in Hawaii, that will look turquoise green. People think that's a gill net um, entangled around the body of the whale. And then up in the higher latitudes, kelp. Whales, especially humpback whales, are thigmotactic. They love the sense of touch. They will play with the gear and kelp is an example of that, or marine debris, and then you got an entanglement. So it's just some quick examples there. What I want to do now with our time is run through how do we cut a whale free? How do you cut the 40 ton whale free? And really it's an old whaling technique. And this is at least basically or mainly, and this is an old, the old Moby Dick movie from, it's got Gregory Peck in it, it's 1956. And it shows the harpoons being thrown into a whale, not to kill it, but to basically gain access to the animal. They got their Nantucket sleigh ride, towing by the boat. If the whale dove, there's a sperm whale going down. They added a barrel to that trailing gear. Hence, the, the, the technique was called kegging, okay? Um, you've seen jaws or things like that, or wicked tuna. That's kegging techniques you've seen. And that's what they did. And they would then lance the whale to death, bleed it out to acquire the product. And so we've modified that technique. And let's just show you some video clips of how that works. Instead of the harpoon, we're gonna throw a grapple. Okay, so in, not to the whale, but to the entangling gear trailing behind. So there's a grapple throw. This is off Lahaina Maui. And now we are getting a Nantucket sleigh ride. Once we're connected to the whale, we've established our own control line. We are towed behind. There's a Nantucket sleigh ride. That's David Matilla, myself, David Matilla, a pioneer in this effort. Okay, and then uh, you know, we're adding poly balls. We don't add barrels these days, but we're actually adding maybe more gear very methodically, very slowly, 
okay, to get that whale to slow down. Remember, they're likely mobile, likely diving. Get them to stay near the surface so we can uh, gain access and do some more assessment. Okay, and then this last one should show you where a whale is not really diving any longer, not sounding, and we're able to pull up behind the whale, get in position to, and let's go to the next video clip, have a knife on the end of a long pole and make that cut. And there was a cut right there. This might take you a couple hours to get this point, but boy, it can be seconds in making a cut that will free that animal. And those same keg buoys, might I mention, will keep the gear at the surface, remove it, and figure out where it came from, what it was, essentially answer the questions of who, where, when, why, and how. Now, what I'd like to do is give you some quick case histories here. And uh, this one, uh, this is one of my favorites, so to speak. It's an adult female that was first reported from shore. So uh, someone from shore actually saw this whale going by uh, on the northeast coast of the Big Island. There was a couple of days of rough weather. The tour boats and some uh, just some people out there on a weekend ended up finding the whale a couple of days later and were able to get a tag on the whale. Couldn't cut it free right away, but put a transmitter package on it. Followed that whale all the way around the Big Island all the time. People were still seeing that whale and giving us additional information until about four days later, we're able to get that whale free. So let's show you that. Again, uh, we've, we've kegged the whale at this point. She's a big whale and she's got five wraps around her tail. There's one of the cuts. And it, there was actually three cuts made. Let's show you one more. I think this will end up being the last cut right there. There's only one wrap remaining, okay? And there is an image as that pole is being pulled out of the water of that last wrap coming unraveled. You can see some, there's some tissue damage there, physical trauma, but she is now free of that gear. So one good case history. And again, the involvement, there's all the gear that came off of her plus our kegging buoys and the transmitter package you see there. Okay. And what I wanna do is point out that that gear that we got off of her, we figured out it came from Alaska. Talk about, well, one, a testament to strength, but just how far and long they can carry this gear. So all those red lines are indeed cases we've tracked from feeding grounds for humpback whales in this case, to that breeding cabin ground, the, the major one here in Hawaii. Okay. So, and then there are a few cases where they go the other way. Okay. So uh, that is a testament of their strength and some of the gear types. And it's, it's more than just that, that was trap gear by the way, but there's, uh, and which is pot gear in my graph, by the way, same, same uh, different name for the same thing. But you see monofilament, you see long line gear, you see mooring gear, which is not fishing gear at all, and aquaculture. You see debris, which may not be fishing gear. And you see for us, and again, these pie diagrams will shift a little bit for each and every region. You see a little bit of net as well. A lot of this is fixed gear, set and left. Now, what I wanna do now with these additional case histories is just point out, see how I'm doing on top, okay, I'm okay. Um, is point out that there are some differences of gear. Okay? It's not always going to be that trap gear or pot gear, okay? And you're going to see some different um, age classes involved. And well, in this case, let's go right to a calf. This is back in 2015 off of Maui. Uh, you can see the tight wrap forward of the flippers on this calf. There's mother behind it. And uh, here in this case, we actually had to build a new knife. And actually, I thought I brought that. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me still. The knife is at the upper right-hand corner, but here is that knife that we made special for these embedded type wraps. And there's the cut being made on that calf, line just exploding off the calf there because it was so tight. So it was definitely a, a life-threatening entanglement. Okay. Oh, by the way, this was, I forgot to tell you that this took a couple of days to, for us to get this calf free. The first day we got um, reports from tour companies and we responded, but we had our, our very typical knife, it's dull on the outside and sharp on the inside, and it was just bumping past that embedded wrap, okay? So that's why two days later, when we had the time to build the new knife and we got more reports, it was two additional tour companies that filled, that reported it and stood by and so that we didn't lose that mother and calf. And it was a, we had to jump to another island and it took us about two hours to get there. So key role they played. Okay, here, this is a yearling humpback whale. Again, I'm emphasizing some examples from Hawaii. This is in the offshore long line gear. This stuff is nasty. It cuts very easily. See it all around the tail of this yearling. This was reported by uh, both tour companies and just 
uh, public out there on their own boats. So that was really cool. And they stood by again. And here, here's what happens. Now, we're not going to keg a whale like this, by the way. So change the technique. It's cutting on the fly. We don't want to pull in that gear. And here we are. I almost bit off more than I could chew if that's playing. But getting a big hunk of that gear around the tail stock of that whale right there. You can see it. I'll let that play a little bit more. Okay. And then I'm going to show you some more videos of us gradually, little by little, working this whale and getting, you know, we're sort of the whale doctors here at this point. And there was uh, three cuts right there. And that showed up, but let's show you the still image. We're almost done, but there's the still image of the video from the video of the three more, three additional wraps being cut off. So, so this is, these are examples of what happens or can happen when people report. That's the message I want to get. And they're part of the team. And this is, I, I threw this in here. This is post. So think, not only do we want to know pre so we can respond, but we'd love to get information on how we did. How did the animal survive? This is like three or four days after we cut the gear off. There is no wraps on that, on that tail stock. These are just little pieces of, of line that are just trailing wounds that we didn't get. And this whale swam by a diver. So this, this person was, talk about reporting. This person was doing a dive and happened to have their camera with them. And the whale swam right by him and showed us that it was doing okay a couple of days later. And this brings a point back to that you can be a reporter of the entanglement, but report the scars, um, the, the outcomes. How did we do? Did we get a recite on a whale that we cut free last year? Um, it just tells us. And we're looking for unique identifiers, things like a scar on the body, um, things like fluke IDs for the humpback whales or the different uh, patternization on a gray whale. Uh, these are the things we're looking for and we get long-term survivorship, the impact to the animal overall. And these digital catalogs like Happy Whale are helping us out. Um, they're part of the team as well. So, okay, maybe one more case here with our time. Yep. And this is going to be a sub adult humpback whale as well. It was anchored in gear on the north shore of Oahu. This ended up being local crab pot gear. And this was ended up being two, two guys fishing in their boat that reported this. They were out there on the north shore and they came across this whale. They did a great job of, you know, getting the report in and giving us great assessment. Okay. And here's going to be the end result of that. This is a pole cam footage. You're seeing the flipper rising to the surface and me trying to get the angle of that knife in there. There's one cut, two cut to the left flipper, and that's enough to free that whale. But again, we needed the information. We needed that reporting. Okay. So another success story. Okay. And here's some of the science. I'm, I'm shooting little examples of science in here too, because remember that's important. And I showed you a, a calf, a couple of sub adults, a yearling. It's heavy on the youngsters. Inexperienced per perhaps, okay? Um, might be what the interpretation, might be the hypothesis here. So and it's, the pie diagram shows a much higher proportion of juveniles getting entangled than that, that's in the population. So predominance there in that regard. For instance, if I showed you Alaska data, you would see the calf proportion of the pie increase greatly as they became or become more independent. Okay? And I mentioned that you know there's these changes out there. One of them is environmental change, climate change. And we're seeing changes in entanglement threat, and boy, other threats as well. I can't go into all the changes here, but the one I'm showing you on the bar diagram was before this most recent environmental change, which I'm sort of showing you the apex of it, the, the main, main part of the time frame it changed in red around 2015-16, where there was big El Nino and the North Pacific blob and the positive phase of the North Pacific decadal oscillation, all creating warm, cell, warm water, cells of water that was less productive, maybe less food, it affects the animals. Maybe they change their distribution, go into areas um, that increase their uh, predominance of entanglement threat. What's shown in the uh, graph though is the change in mouth entanglements that occurred from before and after, from only 10% to around 30% afterwards. Maybe a change in feeding, going to a different area because I have to. I am not, this is no longer my backyard. I'm not used to this area and there's gear here. That's my theory, okay? And uh, it might be one of the examples of why uh, California, the West Coast, and up into British Columbia saw such high numbers of entanglements, especially with the humpback whales, over the last couple of years. Okay? And there's more examples there of different gear types, the sources, where they're coming from, and the age classes as well. 
I got to wind down here and I just want to point out that, you know, our accomplishments. And I'm going to just pull here the Alaska and Hawaii, okay? Over 300 responses, more than 100 animals have been freed from the from the uh, network effort, okay, from life-threatening entanglements, over 35,000 feet of measurable line removed, more than 200 sets of gear either identified or, or identified over after removal uh, for the science side, figuring out what they're getting caught in and how. And that's good for everyone to figure out. And again, a team effort. And I love showing these, but you know, this just happens to be the team in Hawaii after one of the rescues. Uh, and you've got everyone there. You've got a fisherman in the middle. You've got some federal and state agency, you got a tour, uh, tour vessel operator, you've got everyone that, you know, it can be that the first responder becomes a disentangler. That has happened. That's the message here. Maybe I'll give. So, and again, um, you know, we'll do our best to cut a well free, but uh, we don't want people to do that on their own. Okay. Let the people that are equipped train and be a, be a first responder. Call it in to the regional hotlines. As, as uh, Laura mentioned, uh, you can use the Coast Guard. Use that whale alert app. That's another means. You know, use that if you have that. Load it on your on your phone, and you can use that to give us the information. Document, assess, stay safe, stay legal. Um, there is no uh, like unauthorized document um, deputizing in, the, in that regard. So, and if we're going to respond, monitor, stand by the animal from a safe and legal distance. And then here's some. You know, there's online courses, and I highlighted the one at the top is for the West Coast. Okay, so that's the address for the West Coast. And, but there are some other regions there I put on the left margin. So it's like a 20, 30 minute online course. Uh, give a lot of credit to Nature Conservancy and no fisheries on this one. Uh, sanctuaries were able to lend a hand. And, okay. Um, oops. And I must have hit the wrong button, guys. Let's hit play again. It looks like I killed my presentation for a second. Let me bring it back up. I don't know what I hit. Okay, it's back up. Okay, I want to have a summary slide, and that is, you know, what is a success from a disentanglement standpoint? It's getting potentially all the lethal gear off the animal, okay, with minimal injuries to the animal and no injuries on the human side. We want to keep people safe. That's a big one. So stay safe and legal. Be the first responder. Be part of that team. And otherwise, how people can help, they're always asking me about this. It's not all about just, just the reporting side. That is important. That's the last bullet there, by the way. But hey, minimize what we put out in the ocean. If we have to put gear in the ocean, make, try to make it whale safe. Uh, it's kind of a term there. Uh, things like weak links or sinking line or, or ropeless um, buoy lines, things of that nature. And increase awareness. That makes us all, you know, information, share information makes us all stewards. And that can be a big, big bonus there. So, and again, back to reporting. So uh, let's see, I think I did okay on our time, but uh, questions for anyone? I think we left enough time. Ed, thank you. That was fantastic. I feel like I learn more information every time I hear from you. So thanks for that really robust presentation. You're welcome. And, and we do have a few questions. Uh, our first question is, are entangled whales considered bycatch? Is that how they would be classified? Huh. In, in a sense, yes, yes. And I, and I will go one step further, Laura, and whomever asked the question, and that is the gear that's on the whales, in a sense, is marine debris. It is no longer doing what it was meant to do. And that is kind of the classification or definition of marine debris in that regard. So, uh, yep. so yes is the answer. Great. And you mentioned different types of gear that, that whales may be entangled in. And um, I know when I got to go and visit you, you, were, you showed me some very thick cable actually uh, that was on a whale. <clears throat> but then you've also been talking to me about monofilament. Oh, is, I'm sorry, is that an example there? That is great. the cable you're talking about. And I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, this is perfect uh, show and tell here. This is great. If they can see me, this is that five eighths inch coaxial communication type cable that this was like, I don't think it was 450 feet of, it's more than 450, oh, 850, oh my gosh, 850 feet of this was on the whale, through the whale's mouth, um, and we almost got all of it off, so that was a big, big one for that animal, major impact. Wow. So, and I don't know if people can see, but it's like one of those, I can't hardly bend it. So, so this it, is metal then, right? It's metal, it's got uh, uh, galvanized rods going through it with a center communications cable itself, 
uh, copper wire in the middle, but it's the Galvi, Galvi rods. I don't know if people are going to be able to see that oh, yeah. is giving it the strength and, and stiffness here. So, yep. And what did so you use one. to cut that, Ed? What did you do? Uh, special well, knife for that one? or We did not have the right tool at the time. Um, and we had to reach out to that greater community. Uh, so again, that role can expand. In this case, the community members were the ocean safety. It's like lifeguards. Okay. And they were part of the team that had found the whale in that case. They stood by for us. And when we needed the tool, they ran in, found cable cutters, and brought them back out to us. So another, yet another great example. And um, and and just, you know, I'm surrounded by gear here. I went in, gosh, um, here's real quick. I don't know if this is going to work. But here's some of the heavy gauge stuff, the pot here um, from the larger crab pot gear. Wow. This is only part of it, too, that was on the whale. This is this was 400 feet overall. Wow. And there's some um, pot gear from British Columbia. That's a local pot gear. Okay, you can get a sense of the variety of gear, by the way, and the sense of how we want to figure out what it was or what it is. Yeah. Right. Now, yeah, and how a... long can these whales be carrying? You said several months they could be carrying this gear. And how heavy can this gear weigh on them, depending on what type of material it is? Yeah, we're, it can be years, unfortunately. If, we, if we're in a situation where we cannot respond, you know, the animals, again, we don't always respond. We can't. It could be reports always coming in late, too far offshore, no one's standing by. That Boy, that hurts us a lot. When no one monitors the animal, we lose the needle. That is the big haystack. And things like that so we have seen there's been examples of cases uh, i remember one on the east coast where it was years um, that the animal carried that gear and thousands and thousands of miles and the impact of that animal does it affect their their breeding their their eating their diving what what, what does it mostly impact as they're carrying this heavy gear all of the above so it, depending on the complexity here you, it's everything from well the mobility is a degree Right. So if it's if it's complex enough, that mobility is constrained enough that they actually will drown. That doesn't happen that often for a large whale. It is a good point to make because people always want to like they're always saying when they report the entanglement, oh, get here now, the whale's drowning. And that's what draws them into wanting to cut the whale free because they think, oh, it's going to drown. Okay? But it really goes beyond that to things like um, just not being able to make a living that now they're dragging gear that prevents them from feeding on the food resource and that rich herring or something like that. So they gradually over time will starve to death or the gear is such that it cuts into the body causing physical trauma, amputating a limb or causing a systemic infection because that, that gear coming up into the wound acts like a wick that can bring infection, which can go system wide. So those are some of the examples of how an animal, a large whale is generally impacted from entanglement threat. Yep, it's right. a good question. It sounds awful. It, and is it true that there are actually whales out there without tails? Yes, yeah. Yeah, especially, certainly, I mean, a lot of times when they lose, like if, like from the peduncle on, that's that's bad. I mean, that's you're losing your whole engine, so to speak. And, and trying to make a living by sculling um, is gonna be very challenging. I've seen a number of whales though that have lost fluke blades, one side of their tail, the fluke, and they've seemed to do okay. Um, I'm just one example on the East Coast, there was um, one, I think her name was Tira, and she had, she had, um, she actually, her fluke had rotated um, nine degrees, and she, she was a female, and she did have calves, uh, but I bet you she had to work harder. She had to, I think she was an example of waiting longer. The calving rate was longer. She waited more years to get enough energy to have a calf. So, so again, yeah. that hurts the populations, especially this endangered species that a new birth every every time is so critical, right? So we're losing exactly. the ability to rebuild those populations. Exactly. Great, well, thank you so much for explaining that. We have another question about type of gear. So monofilament, what is that exactly? Is that like fishing line from a fishing pole or can you explain that and how dangerous that is? Yeah, monofilament is more like the actual makeup of the, of the line. It doesn't really get at the use. So, you could take monofilament that like someone's fishing from shore, you know, just trying to get their dinner or just sport fishing from shore. And that's usually low test. And, and that does get on whales once in a while, that, that lower test gear, typically from the boat 
and doesn't pose as much of a risk because it's again it's not very strong it's it doesn't it typically hooks versus wrapping but then you get into the heavier gauge monofilament that might be used for like offshore pelagic long lining and now you've got something that's high enough test that's breaking strength okay and and is small diameter that it you know the well can't break it and that small diameter there is no like natural chafe to the wrap so that it cuts very readily into the animal so that's actually one of the the higher risk gear types out there is something that's small diameter and yet strong enough for the animal not to address uh, deal with so wow interesting you wouldn't think that 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 real thin line could really do some damage so yep. thank you for explaining that um another question this is great it sounds like somebody might want to get out there and help us monitor and look look for these whales what's the safe distance that a mm. boat who's being you know playing that role of standby should should take from that entangled whale or is it different Excellent in different question. areas yep yeah and i would say it's my timer <laughs> You're right on time. Make sure I stayed on time. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, I didn't mention this and I should have. And that is, and yes, there are some legal aspects here, but legal aside, it's really just about being prudent, right? About being safe. And that distance I would recommend is 100 yards or 100 meters. Okay, that's a good distance. Let's face it, you're, you're still fairly close to the whale. You're going to get a good enough look to get us that assessment. Um, you do not want to, by the way, do not want to follow right behind the whale. I mean, don't, not even 100 yards right behind the whale. One, it will consider that a threat display. Two, remember, it's entangled. And that gear could be trailing more than 100 yards behind the whale. And you do not want to get that into your, into your jet drive intake or your, or your propellers. You'll be getting a Nantucket sleigh ride the wrong way. Okay, and that's not good for you nor the animal. So, and then here's the other thing is, you know, we do ask for the, you know, the reporting party to stand by. But we do want them to keep that distance because whales, they're just like people, um, they're individuals and they have their limits. And it seems like you can only approach them so many times before they get a little more aggressive, be, become a little bit more evasive. And so I've had times where as well-intentioned as the reporting party was, I pulled up and they said, oh, we kept your whale and I've been getting these really good images and I've really gotten close a couple of times. And, but now it won't let me close at all. And I'm like, oh no, you know, you, it's, you've gotten to that point where the animal's tired of us and now I can't get close to cut it free. So that's another reason to keep your distance is to help let us save a couple close approaches to let us get the whale free. That's really important information to know. Probably something we wouldn't just normally think of. So thanks for, for bringing that yep. up. And uh, just one last question here. If anybody else has, we have a little bit of time. So if anybody else has other questions, feel free to, to chat them to Sayana. But this question is, I think I know the answer to this one, Ed, but do you ever get in the water with a knife between your teeth and, and have to cut a whale free or you're always staying safe in the Zodiac when attempting a rescue? Okay, Laura, that's, that is a, a, a good question. It's actually one that we get a lot. I mean, people will ask me, well, I'm a diver, Ed. I, love, I would love to help you. Again, people are well-intentioned. They want to help, um, and but getting in the water is not the way to do it. I mean, let's, let's look at it from, well, even the, your Olympic swimmers, even an entangled whale, an Olympic swimmer is not going to keep up with the whale very long. Okay, not unless it's in very, very bad shape. Okay, and if you look at YouTube and you you look and you see these examples that you, you know people cutting whales free by jumping in the water, one they're taking on risk and and actually I know of many of those cases where people got hurt, um, and but those don't get posted. People don't post when things didn't go well. They only put it on the internet when it went well. So remember that, I, I, I ask everyone to keep that in mind. Um, and then the other thing is, they generally cut the trailing gear off the whale and leave the lethal rats behind. Okay, if you're swimming up to a whale, I would I say testosterone only goes so far. Okay, and I'm stereotyping there. Uh, they won't swim right up to where the tail is and cut the lethal rats off the whale. They cut the, they, uh, they get about 20 feet from the whale and they cut the, the trailing gear. Maybe that helped the whale, but maybe it didn't help the whale. Maybe it hurt the whale because now there's no way we're gonna find it again. And the lethal wraps are still there. So that could hurt the whale. And of course, again, you took risk. And it really to get at your question, because we've learned our lesson and because now no fisheries has stepped up and said, well, we've gained some information and we've learned that getting in the water doesn't work, generally speaking, and people get hurt. 
there is no in water work now we stay in the boats and we're going to give you tools all kinds of tools here okay that let you stay in the boats and get that whale free okay and that's what the name of the game is so no getting in the water it's and it again it, it typically does not help the whale that often nor well it poses too much risk that's great well those tools are, are amazing but this is tough stuff these are huge animals right so you need really the best tools you can have there yep. Uh, here's another question that just came in. So do entangled whales make themselves more susceptible to sharks or other predatory animals, would you say? They do. They do. And, and folks may have noticed that the yearling that had that monofilament long line on it on the right blade had two good shark bite marks. We think that occurred just as the whale was entangled while it was still anchored in the gear before it broke free. Um, at that point, the sharks took advantage of the animal. And when we're uh, responding to these animals, a lot of times, if they've been entangled for a while, there is or are sharks, in our case, sharks, trailing animal, kind of waiting, because they're hoping it'll be all you can eat buffet at some point in time. It's a terrible way of putting that, I suppose, but that's, that's the strategy. So we have to watch that as well. And that's another reason why not to get in the water, by the way, is it's the other, the other animals, that might be protective of your entangled whale, okay? And it's the predators that are there as well. So, yep. Wow, fascinating. Well, Ed, we could talk all night and I think we're gonna have to do another webinar in the future. It'd be great to, you mentioned that your, your season is just starting. So these humpbacks are coming down from Alaska where they've spent the summer. They're gonna be showing up in Hawaii. So any of you that are traveling to Hawaii this winter, keep an eye out. Um, but it'd be really cool to get you back on here, maybe mid through your season to share with us kind of what some things are happening right then and there, you know, that, that you've been dealing with. So we'd welcome you pleasure. back anytime, anytime. So we just want to leave people, um, with what they can do. You've mentioned a lot of it, but I'd love to just sum up in the last few minutes here of how really it's the community that's not really can just be part of the solution, but it's our first step to the solution. Ed is not out there in a boat all day long looking for whales that are in trouble. He's at his office, right? Getting ready for the call when he might have to go out east, west, north, or south. Um, so it's not practical for him to be out there. So if no one's out there reporting him, these whales have no shot. So again, we wanna just put the, the number up here for you. Cyan has also put it in the chat. Please put this number in your phone. Hopefully you'll never have to use this number, but you know it's like the Heimlich maneuver. You wanna be able to know how to use it in an emergency. And then for those of you that want to come a step further with us and you're interested in learning more about this rescue support team, please send me an email at info at savingoceanwildlife.org. We can get you connected with that online training that Ed mentioned, which is going to tell you, you know, what does it entail? What's the data that we really find valuable um, as you're standing by? And that's something I think is going to solve such a problem, that whole gap between the time it's reported and potentially five hours for the rescue team to get out there. They've spent all this time, money and energy gearing up, getting their folks out there, maybe dealing with harsh weather just to get there and find that no one could stay with the whale. Like we're not even having a shot. And sometimes as it says, and I know in California, they don't even go out for rescue because what's the point, right? They have no idea the direction the whale was going in. I know here in California, 25% of the time, they won't even attempt to rescue if they don't have a standby boat. So those are a couple of ways you can get involved. And certainly, donating your time or your money to our programs, our partnerships with, with all of these great folks doing this great work will really help us. We're a nonprofit. We started just before COVID. We haven't been able to have wonderful fundraisers in person to get all our support. So we're really relying on our virtual events. And if you enjoyed what you saw here tonight, I'd encourage you to consider a donation. Our um, Cyan is putting that uh, link in the chat that you, you can click on. And also, if you're interested in volunteering, we're a super small team trying to do a really big job. And if you have expertise in marketing or you're great at Instagram, we'd love your help. We could use help getting the word out and doing our outreach or join our Doc Walker team and meet with voters one on one to inform them of all of our good work. So with that, I just want to thank you. I'll encourage you to um, go to our website. You can sign up for our mailing list so you'll know when future webinars are going to happen. And you can keep in touch with us on social media as well. So again, um, oh, I just remembered something really important. Actually, Patrick, are, you're still on the call with us, right? I am, I am. We're, we're just after 11 p.m. here on the East Coast, but um, inspired by 
Ed's work and yours. Um, I wanted to stay through to the end, uh, but also as you're aware, Laura, um, in the run up to this webinar, on hearing of our collaboration with Saving Ocean Wildlife, a very generous individual donor to IFAW um, wanted to assist with that. And I, in fact, used the line that, oh, you know, they started in the midst of COVID and um, the critical work that your doc walks and that you and Cyan are doing, um, you know, boater to boater, um, marina by marina, is is so important in bringing information and some of the tools that Ed has mentioned, including the Whale Alert app, where we've been pleased to collaborate with NOAA and Conserve IO in the development of that tool. Um, this um, generous individual uh, who prefers to remain anonymous said that they would match um, the next $2,500, um, $2,500 in donations that supporters would make to saving ocean wildlife. So on behalf of, of um, uh, that donor and um, with the admiration and thanks of all of us from, from IFAW, um, this requires an effort from sea to shining sea um, and is a global problem, as Ed has said. So um, very I'm pleased on the donor's behalf to convey that, that match, which will double anyone's gift that they make um, this evening. Thank you so much, Patrick. That's so generous and that's really gonna kickstart things for us. So I, I do encourage you, if you're thinking of making a donation, this, this week would be would be the time to do it. And um, for those of you that maybe came on late or if you know people that might wanna see what they missed tonight, our awesome uh, tech master, Ralph Butler, who's in charge of the webinar tonight and recording, will be sending you out the recording uh, in the next day or so. So feel free to watch it again or, or send it to others and we'll have that on our YouTube channel. So again, thanks so much for taking time out of your day. I know you could be doing a million other things. So we really appreciate your concern for the whales. And again, Ed, thank you so much for really making this a wonderful presentation. Good night, everyone.